Welcome everybody here to our webinar today. Uh, I just want to go over some household items. And so please, everybody, if you can mute yourself and uh, put your camera offline at this point, just so that uh, we have the full spotlight on Leela, who is the presenter today. If you have any questions, just put them into the chat box and then we can um, see if we can answer them in between the the presentation itself, or otherwise we just get back to them later on. And uh, with further ado, I want to introduce Adam Scherer, the president of Table Tennis Canada. Uh, thank you, Thorsten. I hope you don't freeze out there. Uh, <laughs> when you turn off your camera, you can come inside. <laughs> so we don't want to see a, a body that's frozen up. Anyway, I welcome uh, Lilemani de Soisa, who we all call Lila for short. Uh, Lila and I met actually through the ITTF when I was vice president of the ITTF. Uh, we hired Lila as the actually only the second employee. At that time, there was only one employee. And one of her responsibilities later on, starting in 2003, was to look after gender equity and gender equality. At that time in 2003, she organized a very big uh, conference during the World Championships in Paris which was actually attended by the co-chair of, um, of the International Women's Group, who was a Canadian, actually. Her name is Sue Neal. And the conference was organized by Lila and by this uh, lady called Judy Kent, who was an American-Canadian. So Canada has a lot of influence, actually, on the ITTF's gender equity program. And Lila will mention in a second that's where she actually started in one of the conferences in Canada. So she worked for ITTF for close to 10 years, I believe, when I was vice president and president. Uh, then she moved, she got an opportunity and she moved to Australia working for a university there. And from there, she went to the European Table Tennis Union for five years. Uh, time flies, I thought she was only there for a year or so, but actually it was five years. And then after that, she went independent and she got some, uh, some uh, jobs in Japan uh, where she still is a consultant to the program there. And also she has a lot of contacts with Canada here. So she will help us with our program and basically oversee uh, what we're doing, especially the implementation of the plan that she prepared for us uh, based on our objectives. So um, without further ado, as everybody says when they introduce somebody, uh, here is Lila, and Lila, you can maybe complete a little bit your CV because I left a lot out. Um, yes, thank you, Adam. Thank you, and and very very happy to uh, to be speaking uh, to you today and to be part of uh, this program that you want to start in Canada. Yes, as you mentioned, for me um, personally, this is a very very it's it's a sort of a milestone in my professional pathway as well for a few reasons because. I have been involved in table tennis uh, for a very long time. And of course, as you mentioned, I was one of, the, one of the first people to be hired at the ITTF when you moved to Lausanne. But I have to say thank you also to Canada because my, my, this whole journey uh, in women and sport uh, started at the IWG conference in 2002, which was held in Montreal, to which you invited me uh, through the ITTF. And this was really, um, I keep telling everyone, this was a, a, a wow moment for me because I had been a player. I, I was now working at the ITTF, but I had never given uh, much thought to or had, had not realized all these um, women and sport issues that were being talked about around the world, the, the women and sport movement that was there since 1994. Um, so thank you to Canada. Uh, and also thank you to the ITTF because it's been a fantastic uh, journey uh, for me. Um, and it became like a vocation, you know, it's, it's, it's like, becomes almost like an obsession when you really get involved in the, 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 the topic. Um, so when you're a player, you just play, you don't get involved in the politics, you don't
through the IOC, uh, there, were, there were things happening, there was a Brighton Declaration of the IWG, um, and we had to do something. And I don't know if Adam will tell the story the same way, but I remember coming out of that conference and saying, uh, we need to do something, and you said, you do something. Um, and and we, we sent out a report from the conference to all the national federations and, and sent out the, the Montreal Toolkit, uh, which was produced by, at this conference, which is a very good tool, which I used a lot and I still use um, uh, to all the mem member federations, etc. So, I sort of have a long Lila, before you con continue, Sorry. I forgot to mention yeah. one thing. And you didn't mention it either. Lila actually was a national team member when she was uh, at that age. And uh, also she kept on playing in the Swiss league until quite recently. So she is a table tennis person from, uh, from her childhood. So it's not somebody that we're bringing from outside. Uh, she's actually a table tennis athlete herself. Uh, sorry, Lila, go on. Yes, yes, that's right. I was a player and I think I did, getting into the ITTF was I was kind of a, the right person at the right place at the time. You were just looking for someone who spoke, could work in English and French and who understood table tennis. Um, so I stopped my PhD at the university when I was offered the job at the ITTF. Um, so, you know. And so to cut a long story short, I was there for 10 years and then I went off in the meantime, I was co-opted to the International Working Group. So this was the big thing. We started our program and we were, I think the ITTF was kind of recognized for what we were doing in gender and sport. And I was asked to join the IWG, which I did. And I have been a member ever since. I had a small break. turn out very well. I came back uh, and I joined the European Table Tennis Union where I was working as uh, as the development manager and that was also very interesting because I got involved in um, you know working with children and working with the national coaches, um, young coaches as well as as the top coaches of Europe. So this was a whole new ball game. And it was not very easy at the start, the Sri Lankan Swiss woman coming and telling, you know, trying to tell the Germans uh, and the Swedes and, and, <laughs> and all the top countries what to do, but it worked out very well and it was a fantastic experience for me as well. And then I moved, went to Japan. I met these Japanese professors who uh, had started a legacy program. Japan had just won the bid to host the 2020 Olympics. And it was part of their legacy program, a master's program at a university in, in Japan called Tsukuba, um, where there was, a, there was a master's program and they were giving scholarships, full scholarships to, to foreign students, 15 foreign students. And I was hired to be in charge of international relations uh, and to build a network uh, because these students would have to do internships in, in different federations, etc. So another whole new world. Um, which was very interesting. But what happened when I went to Japan was there was nothing on gender and sport. And we, you know, everyone was talking about Tokyo going to be gender equitable games and this and that, but there was nothing in this legacy program proposed that we should have something. And we started a gender and sport module, which was also extremely interesting because uh, we, I started teaching and I was using. Um, using the ITTF, uh, the work that I had done as a, at the ITTF as a, as a case study. Um, so all this is very long and we can go on and on. And that's where I was also introduced to the sport for development sector, which has now become a, a, a whole new field as well. Um, and uh, I will talk about that in a, in a, in a little while. Um, so that's, that's the short version uh, of about 20 years. And uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so gender equity, gender equality. I think it's important um, to, to clarify some of these questions. Of course, now Canada has got these funds from, um, from, the, from the government to start a program 
uh, as it says in the rally report, uh, endorsed a vision for all women and girls to be equitably represented, recognized and served across all aspects of Canadian sport. The Government of Canada set a vision of achieving gender equality at all levels of sport by 2035. What does this mean? Because it's a, it's a question to ask because I've been involved in this now for about 15, 20 years and we still keep talking about gender equality, gender equality, but what does it actually mean? Um, and these are questions that I've heard asked at big conferences as, as well. What is gender equality? What's the difference between sex and gender? and gender, what's the difference between equality and equity. Um, so, because these terms are also open to, to interpretation and may have, uh, may vary in both extent and form uh, from country to country and region to region. Um, so I let you think about it a little bit. I know maybe some of you are are very well versed in this, but I think it's okay to, to, to think about it and to, to have sort of the same understanding. Um, the, dis the distinctions are important in sport, in particular in sport, because historically people are categorized in a very binary fashion, men and women, you have men's events and women's events. And we now know that this is not really binary. There are people who identify as non-binary as well. Um, and this affects sport more than other sectors of, um, of activity. Sport was created by men for men um, and sport was created for the male body. So we need to agree on a few things when we start out on this project of creating a development program. Um, that these issues are not women's issues. These are sport issues and these are governance issues. So it's always, I still find myself in that situation when something comes up about gender or, or women, everyone looks at the woman in the room, but it should be that. It should be, you know, it's a governance issue. So everybody in leadership should be able to answer these questions and should be able to, should, should have uh, uh, a good understanding of what is being talked about when we talk of gender equality. Um, and then the second thing is that if we, in, in, if that is the case, then we really commit, you have to ensure that the right efforts are put in place and the resources are used for this purpose and not for anything else. Which also means having dedicated people doing the work, not just assigning someone uh, and giving that person a bit of additional, you know, work uh, to look into gender equality. Um, and also not to be careful of the backlash because it goes on, the program will go on very well and then suddenly things happen. And new generations of people joining, young athletes, um, and they need to have access to this education as well. Um, so if you have a women's working group, it should be a long-term thing. Uh, I think women's working groups should, should continue uh, because of the young people, the new young people who come in and who need to have access to this information as well. Next slide. So here's, here's in, in a, a, a quick, answer to the question in general terms. If, um, sex refers to a person's biological status and typically char characterized as male, female, or intersex, which is an atypical combination of features that usually distinguish male from female. Um, we know sex from, you know, so the difference is the biological sex is chromosomes and hormones and reproductive organs, etc. But this is even this is not so easy because now we understand that sex is also not binary, but is on a spectrum um, with evolving notions about what it means to be a man or woman. There's cisgender, gender non-conforming, -conform gender queer, agender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know if you knew that Facebook has over, I think, 50 terms uh, for their user profiles. And in sport where we have male and female, XX and XY chromosomes, full stop, 
um, this does not really tell the full story. Um, and as Sigmund Freud uh, said, gender is destiny, or Judith Butler calls it a performance. And these things affect people, in particular little girls, who are uniquely at risk of um, being pulled out of school, uh, doused with acid, married off at age 12, uh, asked to take hormones like some top athletes uh, to comply with cultural norms of what it means to be feminine uh, or a woman. Um, so gender refers to the socially constructed roles of and relationships between men and women. It's more difficult to, um, more difficult to define. Uh, it, it refers to the social construction of male and female identity. And this differs also from place to place, region to region. Um, it includes the way in which those differences, whether real or perceived, have been valued, used, and relied upon to classify women and men and to assign roles and expectations to them. So gender analysis recognizes, because when you, when you start a program, you need to understand this. Gender analysis recognizes that women's and men's lives and therefore experiences, needs, issues, and priorities are different. Women's lives are not all the same. The interests that women have in common may be determined as much by their social position or their ethnic identity as by the fact that they're women. Women's life experience needs, issues, and priorities are different for, from, for different ethnic groups. And there is what we call intersectionality. So life experiences can also depend on age or disability or income levels, employment status, marital status, uh, geography, where you come from, sexual orientation, uh, and whether they have dependent, dependence, et cetera. So different strategies may be necessary to achieve equitable outcomes for women and men and different groups of women. So this, is, so this means that gender is not about focusing solely on women or females, but rather on inequalities between males and females. Next slide. Um, Lila, I think you have something very close to your microphone and that rubs oh. off. So we have a little bit of sound there, just so you know. Oh. Okay. okay, sorry. Um, next slide. Yes, so equality and equity, the same thing. Equal treatment will not produce equitable results because men and women have different life experiences. Gender equity takes into consideration the differences in women's and men's life and recognizes that different approaches may be needed to produce outcomes that are equitable. So gender Justin's frozen outside. He's standing outside and it's like minus, I don't know how much. Uh, Thorsten, are you with us? Maybe I he am. has to get back. Yeah, okay, next slide she wants. You yeah. lost the slides? <laughs> there we go. Okay, UNESCO. Um, so this is just the UNESCO definition of, of uh, gender equality, which refers to equal rights, responsibilities, opportunities for women and girls, men and boys. Um, et cetera, et cetera, but it's also gender equality is a human rights principle. Now that's something else that we'll have a look at in a little while as well. Um, UNESCO's vision of gender equality is in line with relevant international instruments such as CEDAW, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Beijing Platform for Action, and it's also informed by the reflections concerning the post-2015 development framework. So all this will come in, uh, into, into our development programs, hopefully. Next, and I'll talk about human rights a little bit uh, later on as well. So um, 
the rally report, which has come out uh, now, which we were, I was lucky to get my hands on, um, it came out at the right time because it gives us a lot of information and statistics from Canada uh, that we could think of together uh, when we start this program. So it says um, as many as 62% of Canadian girls are not participating in sport. I think this is, this is a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. Uh, so why don't girls just come and participate? You know, a similar number of boys and girls start out in sport, but more boys are involved in sport as of age nine to 12, and more boys stay involved in sport through to late adolescence and across the lifespan. So why? And, and, and our national federations, uh, do they really understand? Not just what you and I think, but do we really understand why uh, this happens, maybe in table tennis, for example. Across adolescence, one in three girls drops out of sport versus one in 10 boys. And this is seen right across all the continents. Girls drop out of sport in adolescence. Boys drop out of sport for certain reasons, girls for other reasons. So what are these reasons? And what are the reasons in Canada? Because they might not be the same reasons uh, as in, uh, I don't know, Zambia or some other place. Um, next. These are some of the things that came out in the, in the rally report, which I put up because it's very interesting. And if we are starting any sort of program, we need to look at these, uh, uh, these statistics. Um, girls who have parents, guardians who are involved in sport are more likely to participate themselves compared to girls whose parents are not involved in sport. So that's something good to remember. We have to involve the parents somehow um, in the best way, not in everything, but uh, how do we involve them so that this you know, uh, is, is good for everyone. Um, and next, next. These are what we call intersectional barriers. Uh, Girls and women who reported a disability were more likely to report lack of confidence, injury, and body image. Body image is, is something that we really need to understand, um, which is a barrier all over the world, uh, especially in adolescence. Um, and lots, you know, lots of these things that, that affect the lives of girls and women that we don't take into consideration because we don't understand it. But we have a lot of research and a lot of uh, statistics out there now that we should take into consideration uh, if we are going to do um, uh, a development program. Next. Um, the good news is that 89%, sorry, let me just do this. 89% of sport organizations in Canada believe that gender equity is either essential or very important for the organization. So this is good uh, because that is probably why you also get funds from the government because people believe that this is good, but very often we don't know what to do. And I have seen this over and over again in many parts of the world. We talk a lot about gender equity, gender equality. Oh yeah, it's very important. Yes, 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 and stops there. So we really have to find out where the problem is and how, how we can really get people to care about this and to, to do something, to do what, to, what we need to do uh, with a, with a long-term uh, sustainable uh, view of how to do it. Um, Safety, I underlined that a little bit because 69% felt more effort is needed to make sports safe for girls and women. This is very important because I've been doing um, some work now on, on, um, on the, the, the safety issues, the, the abuse, the sexual vi violence and harassment, uh, peer harassment in sport, etc. So something that we really need to um, to address as well. Um, 
And on uh, last week, I was, um, I was, uh, I, I attended the, the, um, the launch of the um, Canadian hub. It's a research hub uh, called eAlliance. Uh, and they have also got lots of funds from the government. And one of their aims is to work together with national sport federations. So this is more a research oriented thing. They want to do more research with national federations to really find out, uh, you know, uh, where they can improve and, and what needs to be done. So it's a good opportunity also for Canadian table tennis, maybe to, to link up with them um, and do some real research. And what's really missing in a lot of places in the world is, uh, and a lot of programs is the monitoring and evaluation that never gets done. So now you have a fantastic hub full of very good um, researchers and, and academics uh, who can help uh, with that as well. Okay, just an interruption, um, uh, Lila. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a question and maybe it's a time to try and address it right now uh, okay. to give you a little break also. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a question from uh, Joe Fisher. And I don't know if there's an answer to this question. I know they have problems in athletics and other sports, but based on your experience internationally, what he's asking is uh, how do we classify a player in a tournament who is born male, uh, but identifies themselves as female? So biologically, they are still male, but they feel as female. Does this person enter the, the male category or the female category? What is the rule or what is your experience internationally? I know that in, in uh, athletics, they have this huge problem with uh, South African uh, athletics uh, participant yeah. who, who is uh, actually a female, but looks like a male. And I don't know how she or he identifies themselves. So what is the answer to Joe's, or do you have an answer to Joe's question? How do we classify a player in a tournament who's born male, but identifies as female? Yes, yeah, so these are the, the, what we call the intersex athletes, like Kasta Semenya from South Africa or Duti Chan from India, um, uh, who are the known athletes, but there are, there are quite a few uh, athletes like that. This is a huge issue. We, we don't know. So I, the, the IAF has come up with this rule where they get to, and, and IOC also has a rule. Um, they, they want you to bring down your testosterone levels, you know, and these are, these are for, for, for me, it's, and, and for the IWG, we, are, we, we had to deal with this when this rule came out. Um, it's, a, it's, for me, it's also a human rights issue. You know, it's not like she's, th these girls are born like that. They identify as females. They, they don't want to change sex because you also have the transgender then. You have all the transgender issues and what's happening in, in world rugby, for example, now. Um, they don't want to change sex. They want to be, to be women, but they're different. So how do you deal with this? This is, this is one of the issues. Okay, so um, no, no immediate answer yet. No immediate answer in the sense that it's, uh, you know, the, I, the IOC has a rule, but it's sort of linked to testosterone. So it's, it's not really the best, uh, best solution. So we have to wait and see. Now my question, the second yeah. question, also to give you a little break, because um, I, when I was much younger, I experienced something quite different. I was always told that uh, when I was a coach and I was coaching both male and female and we have some some uh, women coaches with us today and when we will have the special issue or the special webinar with coaches I will bring this up again in more detail but uh, I was in Japan was when I was 19 years old so that's a very long time ago and I asked this question because Japan was quite strong in both men and women I asked these senior coaches is it better for women to have a woman coach coaching them. I mean, in the gym, in the match, it doesn't really, it's, it's less important. You can have a male or female, but in the gym, is it important for girls to have a woman's coach or does it matter? Should they have male or female? And the answer from the Japanese at that time was that it didn't matter. But when I observed the different clubs we went to and the different universities we went to, 
I could tell if the coach was a man or a woman without seeing who the coach was by the majority of the style of the players, the female players. So how it, how it occurred is like this. If the coach was a woman, most of the players that she was coaching were attacking players. This is very strange. But if the coach was a man, a male, coaching a group of, let's say, the women's team or something like this, the majority were defensive players. So the majority of defensive players in Japan came from men coaches and the majority of attacking players in Japan came from female coaches. And the only interpretation I had is that in Japan, there's huge respect, you know, to the coach. And when the coach is standing at the table facing a little girl, she automatically backs off from the table. She automatically goes back and automatically becomes more comfortable uh, in defense. This was just an observation that I made. So when we do the, the coaching webinar, if you could think about it and see internationally uh, how it works and if my observation from when I was 19 years old was correct or incorrect, maybe it was a coincidence, but this is what I noticed when the, especially when the coach had a very strong personality you know in japan some coaches were very authoritarian and they shout and so on and sometimes they even had sticks at that time uh, most of the girls ended up being defensive players and later on the national team also very good defensive players anyway that was just an interlude for you to give you a break uh, no. Rila, you can carry on no no but it's interesting i mean i mean i can't i can't answer anything there i can't add anything there because Maybe we need to, it's a, good, it's a good observation, so maybe we need to do some research on that. But from a gender perspective, why do they push, why do the male coaches push the women to be defensive players? Maybe they believe that they, they're not very good at, at offensive playing. I don't know. You know, no, so I this think is it was a, a reaction from the girls. I think yeah. uh, the fear, let's say it's an 11-year-old girl and in yeah. front of her is a very dominant male that's coaching and giving instruction. Yeah. I think automatically they stayed far from the table. So they developed into, this is what I think, it developed into defensive players. Uh, but that's like you say, we have to research it. We have Luba that's with us here who uh, for sure will come to the webinar regarding coaches. And she's a woman's coach. We've had a few women's coaches. My wife is also a women's coach. And most of the time, my wife told me that uh, little girls need a coach who is a woman in the beginning, especially. It's better for them. Uh, they feel more comfortable. They feel better and so on. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, because I've seen also some women develop very well with men coaches. So just a remark. I mean, we don't expect an answer. Yeah, for sure, this. sure, yeah. sure. There's a lot of information out there. Um, if you remember uh, a case from the ITTF, we had, I remember this very well because I use it as an example. There was, a, there was someone from Latin America who said that he was trying to get more girls involved, more young, very young children involved in, in, um, uh, in table tennis and, and it wasn't working. And Thing that I, I learned at the ITTF. Uh, so we have to find out what is good and what is not good. At what age is it good to have a female coaches? And it's kind of, you know, you, you don't choose. And to say something about Japan, unfortunately, there is a report that came out recently, Amnesty International, um, I think it was, where it shows that the, the harassment and the abuse in sport is
next time slide is to talk a little bit about the history because this was something that also really opened my, up my mind because I was a top player I was working at the ITTF and all that but I had I had never you know I would had never had this information or didn't was never taught this information and that really was one of the wow moments for me as well learning about for example this woman um, what did I write down? Maybe it's better to, um, yes, when we get to the history of women and sport, we see how all these concepts interact, how stereotypes about gender norms impact sport, how tradition and patriarchy uh, impact sport. So modern sport was created by men for men. Sport was created for the male body. Women are still trained like men, but we know through research now that the female body develops differently. Uh, in ancient times that what was known as the Olympic Games were not were open only to men. Married women weren't allowed in even as spectators. This doesn't mean to say that women didn't play games or di didn't do sport. There was even an event called the Heraean Games uh, dedicated to the goddess uh, Hera held every four years, but only for unmarried girls and funnily enough for prostitutes. So the modern Olympics were created based on these traditions and cultural expectations and norms. Pierre de Coubertin was not, he was not a bad man. He was just a man of his times. Sport was not for women. And this was because there were stereotypical views that women would not be able to have babies. They would uh, become uh, too muscular and grow a mustache, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, and, the, the, and, and Pierre de Coubertin, he was in, he never wanted women in the, in, uh, in the games. Um, and one of the things that he said uh, was that an Olympiad with females would be impractical, uninteresting, and aesthetic and improper. So this lady in the picture, does anyone recognize her? This is an unsung hero of, uh, of uh, Olympic sport, Alice Milia. Next, uh, next uh, slide. Yes, so Alice Milia was, uh, was born in, in 1884 in Nantes in France. She was a pioneer of women's uh, sport uh, in France and in around the world. And she fought for years, she was a rower. She came from rowing. Um, and she, um, she participated in a lot of sports. Uh, she was a swimmer and a, and a hockey player. Um, and she fought with the IOC uh, to, to have athletics uh, introduced into the games. And uh, she started what is called the, um, uh, what was it, the Fédération Internationale de uh, feminine sportive, um, and she organized a thing called the Women's Olympic Games four times. So this getting into the Olympics, women to get into the Olympics didn't happen over, overnight because somebody thought it would be a good idea. It was a, it was a fight. And she is one of the, the people that I had never heard of, that I heard of uh, at the IWG conference. Um, and she had these Olympic games, women's Olympic games. And then of course she couldn't use the word Olympics anymore and, and she had to negotiate with the IOC and that's how athletics uh, came in to the games. Uh, then you have things like Title IX in the United States in 1972, um, which, which changed uh, the landscape for girls and women, um, for, 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 for girls. Um, and coaches as well. The Boston Marathon was open to women in 1972, and you know the story, I guess, um, of Catherine Schwitzer. I have the link there if you want to watch that. If you don't know, it's very interesting. The, this is all to say that this is not ancient history. This is yesterday. 1972 was yesterday. Uh, so it takes a very, very long time. She entered, um, Catherine Schwitz, I think, entered in 1969, the, the, uh, the Boston Marathon. She 
came in with a, she signed up as, as Kay Schwitzer. Um, does everyone know, can someone say if everyone knows, put your hand up if everyone knows the story, so I won't repeat it, but you can watch the, watch the YouTube because it's, uh, it's a wonderful story. Um, and she, she signed up as Kay Schwitzer and started running in this race and they tried to, the, 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 the person who organized the race tried to drag her out and, and, and all that, but she ran and she thought to herself, I have to finish this because otherwise we will put back women, uh, you know, another hundred years and she finished her race. And then they opened the Boston Marathon, but a few years later, not immediately. So all this takes a long time. We have the Battle of the Sexes, 1973, between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. Uh, Bobby Riggs, who was always very sexist and saying that he could beat anyone, any woman on the, uh, you know, top woman at the time. And uh, Billie Jean King challenged him and beat him in a televised match. And that changed, uh, uh, they say that the things for tennis as well. Um, CEDAW, which is the convention for the, for the elimination of um, discrimination against women, included sport. Um, and, um, and this is also important because this is an important UN tool that you can use um, in, in, in case of need. Um, adopted in 79 by the UN General Assembly, uh, often described as International Bill of Rights for Women. And it included, it in, later on included And these are some other key moments in women and sport history. The Brighton Declaration, which is also a very good tool that we will use. We can also sign. I can't remember if Canada signed the, the Brighton Declaration uh, in a, during IPPF times, but we can do it again. Um, the, the IWG was, was born in 1994 in Brighton. Um, where some women just got together and started this conference thinking, you know, wanting to discuss women and sport issues. And, uh, and it has grown into a, into a big movement. And every four years, there's a world conference on women and sport. And ITTF, we've been, you know, speaking at that conference and we've been to that conference uh, since we started the program. And the next conference is in New Zealand in 2022. I hope it will take place, but it will it will happen uh, as a conference, but virtually or otherwise. We'll see how things go. Um, and this, I was here when well, Sepp Blatter when FIFA signed uh, this in 2015. It was only in 2015 that FIFA had actually signed the Brighton uh, Declaration. And in May 2018, we got all the Japanese associations, the five top uh, associations, Japan Sport Agency, NOC, et cetera, et cetera, to sign uh, the Brighton Declaration as well in 2018. Uh, next. The Beijing Platform for Action. I think we heard a lot about it this year because it was the 25th year. Uh, that also included women, uh, included sport and physical activity um, uh, in 2000 and when was it, 1995. Um, included sport, that's what I, I wanted to say um, uh, about the Beijing Platform for Action. Um, and 25 years after the Beijing Declaration, this is what Merck and Angela Merkel said the other day, Equality should be a given, but we still have a long way to go. Get on board. Let's work together to really target the Beijing goals. The faster, the better. Okay, so we're still saying this. Let's get on board. Let's do gender equality. Um, so there's something that we're doing, which is, I don't know, not right or 
too slow. Uh, next. The women and the Olympic agenda. Now we worked with this a lot. I don't know, Adam, if you remember, but 1997, uh, the IOC Women and Sport Policy established targets for NOCs and for international federations, but for their, for their uh, organizations. 10% uh, women in executive boards by December 2001 and 20% by December 2005, which they never reached. Um, but now they say that they've reached 47% uh, women in commissions uh, and committees. Um, uh, Agenda 2020, that is something that I suppose everyone's working with. I know international federations, I don't know how it goes with national federations. Um, the IOC to work with international federations to achieve 50% female participation in the Olympic games. So the leadership part has somehow kind of fallen out of that. And the, and the conference, the IOC World Conference is not held anymore, um, but they want 50% female participation in the games. Um, this is getting people to participate in the games is not the most difficult because you can you know, bring give you wild cards and you can bring people in, but really working with the national federations and going really down to grassroots and changing something that is a lot more complicated. Uh, IOC to encourage mixed team events, which is good. I think we did that. I think ITTF, we did that also with the, with the Youth Olympic Games. We were, I think, one of the first federations to propose a mixed, uh, a mixed event there. And then December 2016, the IOCB called for a minimum maximum uh, minimum target of 30% women in leadership positions within the Olympic movement by 2020. And there's always these percentages as well, 20%, 30%. Okay, 30% might be a critical mass, but uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you train only 30%, you're not going to get 100%. Uh, so that's something to think about as well. And now there's IOC Gender Equality Review Project, which uh, gives a whole 25 recommendations for international federations. And that is also something maybe we can look at um, in another, another webinar, because that's, that's quite interesting to look at all the, the areas that they work, uh, they want work done, like the media, leadership, all that. So that's something we can do um, as well. Next. Yes, this is just, just to say all the other issues that you have to look into if you're having a holistic approach to the, to the program, sport media, uh, propagating stereotypes. I remember the ITTF, we started looking at the magazine and saying, hey, why don't we have more pictures of female athletes? We started giving the three media, reserving one of the media scholarships for a, for a female, uh, which was not open before. And then I remember in Shanghai, it was three women who won uh, the media scholarship. So this kind of media, the sport media and propagating stereotypes that we have to look into um, and harassment and abuse in sport. Uh, this is really a very, it's, it's not an easy topic, but, and, but there's no harm in talking about it, there's no harm in preparing, you know, mitigating risk. Uh, so having education on this is also, I think, very, very important with coaches and with uh, athletes. And there are the issues like the gender testing, the equal wages, equal prize money. We were one of the first to do that as well at ITTF, which was very good. And the lack of female role models working on, on really educating because in, in, we, we have this tendency to say, oh, all sports, you know, all athletes are great role models. I don't think so because some of them really are not great role models um, and that just dis can destroy your sport. Um, so building uh, role models and that comes also with leadership uh, more women in leadership, giving people a voice, give, hearing women's voices um, more, etc. And then also looking at 
the the disabled athletes in the same way. I mean, that's what we were planning. We were starting to do at the ITTF when I left, uh, looking at Paralympics and women's para women's sport uh, through these lenses um, as well. Next. Yeah, these were just some funny things that I found. Uh, for example, talking of the media and this girl who put it up says, this headline is a metaphor for basically the entire world. Phelps ties for silver in 100 fly and in little letters it says, Ledesky sets world record in women's 800 freestyle. And this one from Canada is an old one, which I found in a Swiss newspaper talking about Sidney Crosby, you know, sets the country on fire. And at the bottom there, there's a tiny little thing saying that the women's team also won uh, gold. So these are, these are little things. Um, this is a picture from India. The next, next please. <clears throat> this is when Thomas Buck won his uh, presidency and he went to India. And, uh, and this was when he met with the National Olympic Committee. And, uh, and there were absolutely no women. There was not one single woman. And I think he missed the, missed the opportunity to really say something. I think he said, ladies and gentlemen, and then he laughed because there were no ladies or something like that. But it was an opportunity that he missed to really say something uh, about gender equality there. Um, okay, I'll interrupt you one more time, Lila. Yes. Just uh, one comment from me, and then there's another question. So uh, the comment regarding actually the gold medal in Vancouver for the women, uh, yes. of course, Crosby scored and it was the last event at the uh, Olympic Games and that gave Canada 14 gold medals and so on. But the gold medal for the women also was very important because they had lost to the Americans several times just before and then they beat them at the finals of the Olympic Games. The women were very upset actually that the press in general didn't give them the attention that they should have had. Uh, it, the only attention they got is that they were drinking actually champagne and they went skating on the ice and celebrating and so on. So they were actually criticized for doing that oh, instead of being uh, honored for winning the gold medal. That's just a, a little, a little um, uh, from my memory when I was there. Yeah. Now there's a question and I may have the answer to this, but also I would like you to answer it. It's also from Joe Fisher. He says, mm -hmm. how can you achieve equal prize money? And I know we did it at the ITTF. Maybe it's more difficult at the local level or the national level. Uh, for both male and female, when in one sport, uh, let's say in an event, you have 100 men competing, and then in the other event, you only have 20 females. So for example, if we look at from economical point of view, uh, let's say the, the organizer are base, basing their finances on the entries, you have 100 men entering, paying about $20 each, and then you only have 20 women entering. How would you give both of them equal prize money? Now, I know a long time ago when I was responsible for table tennis in Canada, we gave equal prize money anyway, uh, basically because there was at one point a lot of complaints from the top women players who were saying, if I win this event, it's not my fault that there's only 20 who entered and 100 men who entered. I'm winning the same title. So the title should have the same value. And I used that, that memory when I was at the ITTF, when, we, when you were pushing us to give equal prize money. And we decided that next year, we didn't do it immediately, we decided next year when we budget, we will budget equal prize money for equal events, regardless of the number of entries and regardless whether it's male or female. And we implemented this. You reminded me the other day that it wasn't immediate. We took some time before we implemented, mm -hmm. but eventually we did implement it. So to answer uh, Joe's question, uh, do you reduce the prize money for the men? Of course not. Uh, how do you increase the prize money for the women? So that's a difficult question more at the local level. Uh, my attitude at the ITTF and before in Table Tennis Canada was we just do it and then we work out the budget in such a way that we ensure that men and women get the same prize money for the same event. Um, in tennis, it's not like that. Uh, you know, the men get prize money and the women get less. 
uh, in some events now it's equal, but in most events it's uh, it's not the same. So what is your experience internationally and also from the ITTF, if you can remind me, how we handle this issue? Well, in the ITTF, how we handled it, it took a long time in the sense that we had several meetings and there were people who were against it. And I remember someone even laughingly saying, the women don't perspire as much as the men. It was a joke, but I heard stuff like that as well. I think you have to believe, you have to, an international level, the women went to the same events. You know, they flew, they, they trained the same, they flew to the same events and they got paid less. When I was playing in Switzerland, I remember I won a, won a tournament once and the men got money. I don't know how many women were there, but it was a big tournament. I had to, you know, it was, I didn't know at the time, we didn't think of these things. The men got money and I won a sewing kit. It was a very expensive, big sewing kit. And I, I didn't know what to do with this. And I remember saying, can I have a bag and a racket or something instead of this sewing kit? It was probably a very expensive and I gave it to a friend. Uh, so this, I don't know, I don't have an answer, but in, in Sweden, in, in some sports, they, the men have actually taken a, a pay cut uh, so that the women could be paid the same. Um, and if you pay the women better, maybe you might also get more women playing. You know, so we you have to really sit down and 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 see uh, what has to be done. But I think the fair thing is to is to give equal prize money, and I know that it's not always easy because we don't have the have the money. Um, but I we we have to think about it because I don't think we have asked all the right questions. Uh, look at what's I happening. Think, I think at the national level. At the national level should be no problem. I think we can do equal prize money because the difference in the budget will be minimal. Um, I think the problem for Joe and other organizers of local tournaments is the budget, as you said, is extremely limited and they work it based on the uh, income that they receive from the different sources. So that's, that's something we need to discuss internally when we have the next meeting with the provincial associations, how to ensure that there's equal prize money for men and women. Maybe in the beginning, we, by we, I mean the National Association has to do something to, to equate it. Uh, but eventually you are right and all the women are right that complain that if I win the Ontario Open, whether I'm a man or a woman, I should be rewarded the same way. Uh, definitely uh, <laughs> receiving a sewing kit is a, quite an insult, I would say. But maybe at that time that was still acceptable. I don't know. But today, today, if a woman, you give her a sewing kit, she'll throw it back in your face, for sure. <laughs> this was some time ago. But what's happening in the United States? I mean, I think that we have, we, we, there are all systems that are still working uh, in the United States, the, 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 the lawsuit of the of the football team you know they bring in more money they have won world championships and they're still earning much less than the men who have never won a world championship um so it's yeah this okay is anyway you can continue after the indian guys yes after the indians we go next one uh that is uh, that is where is this? Oh yes, this is the IPC, uh, the Brazilian National Paralympic Committee. Um, I think there's one woman in there and they are also talking a lot about gender equality and trying to do stuff and this is a picture. Now I'm geared to this, this is what I say, it's like an obsession. I look at all these pictures and you know, ask the question, where are the women? Next one. This is the Japanese government as well. Uh, a lot of you know talk of doing gender equality, this and that. We need more women, and uh, and uh, I think some were taken in. There were quotas, and then it went back to to this. So next, yeah, these were just some some funny things. This was a Saudi Arabian conference where uh, talking about a women's conference. And, uh, and the other one was, I think the American Senate discussing uh, reproductive health rights uh, and there were no women there. 
So next. And this is also from, from 2017 in the, in the local newspaper here, uh, the marathon of Brussels. It's the same marathon. The same amount of women ran in it, I think. And the men got a thousand euros and the women got 300. And this hit the news. Next. Uh, yes, so this was, this can also be another, um, another uh, webinar because I've been kind of teaching this in, uh, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, in 2002, we started this thing and we did a survey and that's something we could also do uh, in, in Canada. Um, and we found out that there were absolutely no women in, in decision-making positions. I think there was one president at the time, maybe it was Sherry Pittman in the United States, but no one else. There were no women coaches, no women officials, no, no, no. And that's how we sort of started. We had to have some numbers and, and that survey was good because we got some numbers um, and started the program. Uh, next. Which one is this two by two? Uh, equal prize money. I mean, we, this was a big achievement at the ITTF. And I don't know what it, what we, another thing is that we never had a, had a, um, any monitoring and evaluation of all this stuff that we did. Uh, so I don't know. I remember asking the, the, the top players at a, at a meeting uh, because we started these, you know, educational meetings for the top players. And, and I asked them, are you happy with equal prize money? Oh yeah, very happy, fantastic. And, and I said, why didn't, why didn't you ask for it before? And the coaches and nobody could answer that because this came from the ITTF, this came through the program, uh, but none of the, the players had asked for this. It didn't come from the players. So, but this was a big achievement and, and I think uh, it's something we can be uh, proud of. Next. It's now 9.10. Is it, what's the time? Um, we are going a little bit over, over time. Can we, can we go on? Adam? Oh yes, we can, uh, we can continue. Thank you, Lila. Continue a little bit. Um, just stop me, okay, because we still have a bit more to go, but we can also take this. Uh, go on now, and if we cannot finish, we will continue at the next time. Okay, so sport as a human right. Now coming to this whole sport for development field, which has grown exponentially. I remember being involved in sport for development, what was known as sport for Devel development, even at the time at the ITTF when we had the Shrak project, uh, for example. But having learned the theory, um, I, I know that we were sort of doing, you know, not, it was good. What we did was good, but uh, that whole field has, has evolved a lot. And there's, a, there's so much that we can now apply to any programs that we start. Uh, lots of organizations, lots of uh, federations are doing this. We have foundations that are you know, developing, I don't know what, in different parts of the world, but it's not really done uh, from a, with, with, with the right, um, right knowledge, not based on the right knowledge. So there's still a lot uh, we can do. Just like gender and equality, human rights are also represented and misrepresented and used in all kinds of ways. Are women's rights human rights? Uh, CEDAW, for example, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination is still not ratified by the US, and neither is the International Rights of the Child. Um, and the UN Charter and the UN, UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which was signed in 1948. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the it was also interesting. It's something that has now come up recently in some research um, that um, it, was, um, it was women from the global south like uh, Bertha Lutz, uh, Bernardino, Indian women 
who, who had the wording of the UN declaration changed to include women. Um, because it started off by all rights are, um, how did it go? Um, all men are born equal or something like that. And they had to fight to make it all human beings or all humans are born equal, uh, et cetera. And, and Bertha Lutz tells the story of how the British and American women came and told her, don't start talking about women right now because it's not, it's not, it's not the right time. Uh, and, and they fought for it and the wording was, uh, was changed. Um, yes, all human beings are born free and equal and not all men are born free and equal. Uh, so sport as a human right, we are told this all the time, you know, sport has the right to change the world and sport is a human right, but when it comes to actual application, uh, there are lots of things that are not really working right, especially when you see the abuse uh, and harassment uh, issues that come up in, in Yeah. Next slide, Thorsten, please. Thorsten, my man. The next slide, there it is. Yeah, next, next, I think I said uh, enough about this. Physical inactivity caused about 3.2 million deaths each year. Um, yes, we can go over that as well. Next. Physical literacy, I put that in there. Uh, yes, because we were also talking about um, uh, the need to include lifelong, lifelong physical inter uh, literacy through schools and sport clubs. And the National Association has a role to play there. Um, because some of the research that we did for UNESCO, this lifelong participation is not given to children uh, young enough. And there's, you know, women, especially women, fall out of sport at girls, at adolescents, and then after a certain age, after you have children, you forget about physical activity and sport. So this is something also that should be, uh, be a topic there, national federations uh, work on that. And you were talking to me about aerobics TT, which I think is, is, is a good idea to get girls involved, but it must give an, also an education module, discussions with the girls so they understand that this is good for now and forever. Uh, work with a friend of mine, on menstruation. Now that is something that we never talk about. Coaches don't talk about it. There's a lot of taboo around it. Um, and girls drop out of sport. And top athletes have huge problems, but we never talk about it. So that is maybe something also that in the coaching uh, curricula that we can add, because now there's a lot of research, there's a, lots of ways of uh, dealing with these issues um, uh, that, that, that we can bring in to coach education. Uh, next. Economic value of sport. Why did I put that in there? There's a, yes, yeah, sport is big business. We know that. Um, and um, there is also, you know, issues of doping. Uh, there is a new plague of illegal gambling. There's corruption. Um, so it's, it's sad that all the good values of sport are mocked and ridiculed by the very same people benefiting from sport. Um, and while the UN recognizes that sport can also at times negatively influence society with corruption, scandal, and incitements of violence, their positive influence far outweighs their negative aspects. So sport has a unique power to attract, mobilize, and inspire. By its very nature, sport is about participation. It's about inclusion and citizenship. It stands for human values, such as respect for the opponent, acceptance 
of binding rules, teamwork and fairness, all of which are principles which are also contained in the Charter of the United Nations. Um, I put that in there because next, it was to, next, next slide. Uh, it was to talk about sport for development. And that is also something now we could really teach uh, so that when, when you come up with something like gender equality, we really understand what we are talking about because we have sport, the sport for development movement and the Kazan action plan, which comes in a slide uh, later, which is the only framework that we have on how to use sport uh, to address the millennium development goals. Now we have people working in sport federations who have never heard of the Millennium Development or the Sustainable Development Goals. I have come across people who are working in federations and who don't know about this. But this, where the UN says that sport is also a great enabler and the IOC is now pushing for it as well, how to use sport for development. And that's where the gender equality comes in as well. Next slide. Okay, I'll interrupt you again, uh, Lila. Yeah. Uh, so we're almost actually there's just a few slides left, but uh, we're running out of time. Yeah. So uh, what I would like to explain is that for me, 80% of what you said today, I didn't know anything about. So for me, it was an eye opener about the past. I knew a lot about the ITTF stuff because I was president of ITTF, but a lot of items that you talked about, about women and sport, I didn't know at all. Uh, I was shocked actually by some of the, the dates that you gave because they're very recent, some changes that happened very, very recently, not really a long time ago. And I agree with you that these changes take a very long time. Uh, I believe that at the national level, we have of course a role to play, but we receive a finished product. That means that we have elections, for example, for our board, and we have no candidates that are female, or we may have one candidate that's a female. Uh, we cannot create, you know, the, the candidates. So it has to, the, the, the numbers have to be bigger at the lower level. So the plan that we're putting in place that you helped us uh, develop, that we will start in, in January, actually, uh, the main target is to increase the number of players who are girls uh, from the very beginning, from the start. How to do it from the national level is going to be a huge, uh, huge, huge, huge undertaking because we really are not involved at the grassroots level and we are not involved at the in initiation level. Uh, and as you said, uh, you may have same number of athletes, boys and girls starting, but then the girls drop off more and the boys drop off less. There's still a drop off. So at the end, uh, when we come to female coaches, female umpires, female referees, uh, female administrators, the number that remains is very, very small. Not as bad as in Japan and India and Saudi Arabia that you showed us, but still mm -hmm. quite small. Things that we can control, for example, hiring staff at the moment, it's 50-50. Uh, but there are things that we cannot control. And I had this discussion with our government uh, saying that you give us money to do things. But if I look at the actual results uh, from 20 years ago till now, with a lot of effort in trying to have equality for, for girls and for women, basically we have in, in uh, table tennis in Canada, 18% participation in competition, which are female and the rest 82% male. It's a huge discrepancy. In some sports, it's even lower. It's 10% or in some sports, it's 12%. We have about 18% and we're trying with this program that you helped us develop, which we will start soon, to increase that number. Now, the trick is everything we've done before doesn't really work. And I mean, you said it also when you were talking mm. that uh, the numbers don't reflect uh, the effort. Uh, so we have to find something new. I think we have to find new methods of training girls so that they stay, as you said, past the menstruation period, so they don't all suddenly drop off when they're 13, 12, 13, 14. Uh, we have to find maybe different style of competition. All our competitions are the same for boys and girls. 
uh, maybe for the girls, the competition has to be a different style. I don't know what, but uh, we have to, Luba has to think about it, Erica Ants has to think about it. Uh, all the female coaches that we have need to think about it. Also the female officials, how can we modify our competition for, for women and for girls to make it more interesting? And my wife always used to say also that in training, girls like to train in groups. Uh, whereas men or boys, yesterday we had this long discussion with Jeremy Hazen, he likes to train alone. So it's quite a different uh, perspective between boys and girls, men and women. Women like the social atmosphere of going to a club and training. We don't have that really well developed in Canada as well. So we will be addressing all these points. And mm -hmm. for the rest of your presentation, because of the time, and it's my fault, yeah. I interrupted you several times. Uh, what we will do is with Thorsten, we will record the balance and then we will make it available on YouTube. This, what we did up to, to, to this point today will also be on YouTube. So everybody that has not attended in person can see it and can actually review it. And then we will add the second part as well. Then next time we come together again, like this live will be specifically for coaching. And you, Lila, said that you will introduce us to some experts that will attend. Uh, we will have also some of our female coaches in Canada attend so that we can start talking about very practical things. How can we coach girls and keep them interested in our sport from, from the club to the competition? What do we need to do to do it properly? So on behalf of Table Tennis Canada, I'll give you the last word and then we'll pass it to Thorsten to conclude. I'd like to thank you very, very much. Obviously, you have a wealth of, uh, of uh, experience and information. It would take many, many sessions like these, but it was very good for us to get some awareness, some historical background and a little bit what's happening during in the world. You also have very good contacts with the Canadian Association of Adv Advancement in Women. C-A-A-W-S. So you said you promised that you will put us more in contact with them so that we see how they can help us. Uh, basically, we hope that a year from now, we have made some kind of progress. But as you said, it takes a very long time. So we will see what happens. So thank you very much, Lila. I give you the last word and then uh, Thorsten can conclude. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. No, I, I hope it was useful. I don't think we've missed much because the rest is all about SDG 5, gender equality, and, and especially gender-based violence. So that could be another webinar, actually, because we can talk for, for an hour about, about what is out there and, and the research and how, how we can deal with that. So I don't think we've missed much. Uh, if we can go to the end of the... the uh, yeah, so next, next, yes. What next? And uh, and that's, yeah, so that's it. Cause CAWS, they've changed. Now it's the Canadian Women in Sport. So cause doesn't exist anymore. It's uh, Canadian Women in Sport. And this is it. I think you have a lot of people in Canada who can, you know, best practices from also other sports and also all these Canadian top coaches who could be part of, uh, of, of one of the webinars and talk especially about the issues that you just uh, brought up. So making these right partnerships, I think is, is uh, important. And I, we have all the contacts so we can do that. So thank you very much for listening and, uh, and we see what we do next. Okay, over to you, Thorsten. Yeah, that was uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Lila. And I, I second the partnership part is something that's dear to my heart. And that's what we always do with the, with the Canadian, Canadian Coaching Association of Canada, for example, and, uh, and many other partners around Canada. So I think that's uh, one of the more important things as well. And as Adam said, I'm second that I didn't know some of these uh, statistics and numbers and even the history of that as well. So <laughs> that it was so recent. You're right there, Adam. That was pretty, pretty scary in a way. So if you have any questions, um, send an email to um, ttcan at ttcanada.ca and then we'll uh, forward those to Leela. And um, then we'll just uh, stay tuned, everybody, for the next webinar coming up. And uh, I appreciate everybody coming out. That was very nice to see the attendance as well. And some, we had some great questions and some 
great ad great additions there from Adam. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, wishing you all a wonderful weekend. Before you Thanks go, everybody. there was a comment from Luba. So we will make sure that uh, that Lila gets it and she can respond to Luba directly. Uh, I think I could respond to part of it as well. But in the interest of time now, and for Lila now, it's she's six hours ahead of us. So it's a little bit later. So thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>